<laughs> Let's go for it. Good evening, colleagues from Asia. Good afternoon, colleagues from Africa and Europe. And good morning, colleagues from the Americas. Welcome to the annual Global Protection Forum uh, 2020. Uh, like every year, the GBC convenes a forum to discuss challenges that we face, big change lessons learned, and try to provide strategic direction to the cluster. The 2020 Global Forum is jointly hosted by the GBC Strategic Advisory Group and the AORs. As you know, there are four AORs, which is the Child Protection AOR, the Gender-Based Violence AOR, Housing, Land and Property, and Mine Action. This year, the forum is 100% online, and I think we all know why. Now, this online webinaring is, of course, for all of us, a bit of a learning process. But anyhow, please do let us know how we can improve by filling out the evaluation form at the end of the session. This session will be recorded and I trust that you're all fine with that. The topic of the session of today is cross-sectoral work as a condition for high impact MHPSS. Welcome everybody. I'm Kun Sevenans, I'm uh, the lead of MHPSS and the CP. Uh, AOR and the co-host co today of this webinar is Sarah Harrison, co-lead of the MHPSS reference group. Sarah, over to you to uh, go over the agenda. Thank you very much, Colin. It's delightful to see so many of you online. So welcome. Um, all of you. Um, as you can see on the slide um, that I hope you can view on your screens, um, we will have opening remarks for this session by Michael Copeland, who is the Global Child Protection Area of Responsibility Coordinator. And then we have um, an, a panel discussion that we moderated by Kuhn, um, where there's an opportunity also for you as participants to write questions in the chat function, which we will also come back to. And the panelists are from the health um, cluster or health sector and education. And then we're very lucky to have the opportunity to have Elizabeth Stickman from um, USAID, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. Um, and I will be uh, interviewing Elizabeth and, and getting her perspective um, from, from a government agency um, who does a lot of um, financial and political support um, to both protection and mental health and psychosocial support programs um, globally. And then we have a quiz for you um, that we will use through the, the Zoom function, uh, so an opportunity for, for you to, to use your brains and, and interact. And then in the second part, we have a panel discussion that will be moderated by myself with colleagues from Mine Action um, and GBV, Areas of Responsibility, and also a colleague um, from the nutrition, um, sectoral nutrition and NMHPSS area. And then we will have a review on what we've learned in the event today. And then we have closing remarks by um, William Chimali, who is the Global Protection Cluster Coordinator. And William will also be um, highlighting and speaking about a publication that's just come out, in fact, in the past two hours, um, in relation to protection and MHPSS. And then we will end the event, um, for those of you that have the opportunity to stay online, um, with a, a, view, a viewing of the My Hero Is You children's animation video as well. So thank you, Kuhn. Uh, fantastic, uh, Sarah. So we have some uh, little rules here, actually. If you are a speaker, um, Kindly keep your microphone on mute and your, uh, unless you are a speaker, kindly keep your microphone mute and your video off. And please, we really encourage you to ask your questions, your comments and ideas, uh, share them all in uh, the chat. Sarah, um, finally in the last years, MHPSS is getting a bit more attention and that is well deserved, isn't it? Yes, it's well deserved. I'm very biased, but it's well deserved. <laughs> So what happened? What, what are the things that, that brought it very much in the attentions? What are the indicators actually? Yes. So I'm going to take you all back into the very distant past of December 2019, um, where uh, there was actually a series of events um, and initiatives that happened actually at the end of what was also a very busy year last year in the humanitarian sector. So um, there was a global refugee forum event that was held at the UN Palais in Geneva that many of you attended. And at that event, there was a specific event on mental health and psychosocial support that also um, had panelists and um, pulled in people from different sectors. So there was also colleagues from health, from education there from and from protection. 
as well, as well as researchers. We also had um, a statement released by the IASC principals. For those of you who are not familiar, the IASC principals are the heads of all the UN agencies and um, heads of IACRC and IFRC. And they um, announced at their meeting in December that mental health and psychosocial support is a cross-cutting issue that's of relevance across the entire humanitarian system. And that's quite a powerful statement because it then needs to be translated into operations. And then thirdly, in December last year, we also had um, the International Red Cross Red Crescent Conference, where there's 196 state parties to the Geneva Convention, um, who actually signed and adopted a resolution on the importance of mental health and psychosocial support in conflict, um, armed conflict, um, and other emergencies, as well as natural disasters. So that was in December last year so a lot happened and then of course this year um, we've all been thrown a little bit off balance so politically this year a lot has also happened and um, we had a, a brief released by the united nations secretary general um, stating the importance of mental health um, so very strong leadership buy-in from from the united nations side we also recently had united nations general assembly resolution um, on non-communicable diseases where it specifically states that mental health and psychosocial support is, is required and should be embedded in all emergency response plans um, and systems, and states are requesting support to do this. Um, and we also forthcoming have a, what's called an ECHOSOC, a humanitarian resolution that will come out in December, where we again have a paragraph on MHPSS. So politically and on a humanitarian diplomacy perspective, there's been a lot happening in the past um, nine months, both at state level, states are placing this as an area of importance, but also within the humanitarian system. Um, we also have a number of tools that the, the Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Reference Group under the IAC have released this year. I think as with most groups, we've, we've produced a huge amount of guidance and tools that are being adopted. The difference is that within the ISC, the mental health and psychosocial support tools are among the most downloaded and the most requested. Um, one of our tools, the My Hero Is You Children's Storybook is now available in 127 languages and it's the 10th most translated book ever in the history of the world. So there's clearly a need. Um, that's happening globally, um, irrespective of what we do at, a, at a, a very high political level. And operationally speaking, um, we have mental health and psychosocial support as an indicator now within the global humanitarian response plan that came out that many of you um, are involved in at country level. And this is the first time that we've had a specific indicator in which to measure our work. Um, we also have a, a doubling of the number of mental health and psychosocial support working groups at country level. We used to have 22 at the beginning of this year and now we have 42. And that's as a direct result, unfortunately, of the virus, but also the need um, for mental health and psychosocial support programming and, and the need for it to be better coordinated. And then finally this year, operationally speaking, we also have an interagency deployment mechanism where we can deploy people to emergency contexts. This is an initiative supported by the, the Netherlands government and the Netherlands standby partner. And we've had a number of requests this year, all of which we've been able to fulfill. And we've had so many requests that one sixth of all GHRP countries um, have had a, an MHPSS international deployment to support their work. So there's clearly an operational demand from country level for MHPSS and for MHPSS to also be cross-sectoral as well. But thank we're not there yet. Um, it's a it's an ongoing battle. It's a consistent I think fight. On with, with many things actually that, that we have achieved uh, uh, as MHPSS workers lately. Um, but still, of course, there are still many problems. Where we're still underfunded. Uh, uh, also, uh, there is still too much split off between what protection work does, uh, called PSS and, and, and mental health, and uh, also COVID is by most people still. Uh, seen as only a virus that travels around without that other aspects, for example, uh, food security and increasing child marriages, and especially, of course, also the mental health crisis that provoked common off in the limelight. Uh, but thank you, uh, Sarah, for that. Um, Michael, I'm going to give the floor to you, the virtual floor to you for some opening remarks. Thanks, Thanks Colin. Checking you can hear and see me okay. 
Yes. Great. And and thanks, Sarah, for, for the introduction. So as Sarah is saying, we have attention and we have some space and we have some improvement in the country level coordination structures. My sense is the window is open, but it may close before too long. So we need to move now more than ever on mental health and psychosocial support. Cohen started to mention some of the challenges that are there in terms of children and mental health and psychosocial support. And it's always matted, and I'm turning the volume up, it's always matted, but now more than ever with COVID-19, uh, we see, for example, the Global Protection Cluster recent reports referencing two thirds of operations with increases in child marriage, recruitment of children to armed forces and groups, and online sexual exploitation now being seen more and more in specific country operations. And that comes on top of what we already had, um, incredible levels of armed violence, armed conflict, and an increasing use of detention as a measure against children perceived to be a security threat associated with different armed forces and groups, or even just for trying to seek asylum or a better life, being detained without their loved ones, loved ones with devastating impacts for their mental health. So it always mattered. It matters now more than ever. We have some space. We need to move ahead collectively. And we need to do that by describing in more detail at country level the situation for mental health and psychosocial support. So one of the jobs of coordination groups across the protection cluster and other clusters is to determine the need and the scale, providing the evidence. And one of the particular challenges for protection I wanted to reference is that we come under pressure to mimic other sectors and really provide quantitative data. And that can be challenging in protection generally, and it can be challenging for mental health and psychosocial support needs because we know that collecting household level data at scale on some of these issues can be unsafe, inaccurate, and also unethical if it's not backed by services as well. So in describing those needs, I'd like us to think about the available information, including prevalence data, and how as a protection cluster and working with other sectors, we can get better at using prevalence data. For example, that coming to us from WHO, where we understand up to 20% of children may have significant mental health issues coming out of violence, conflict, um, violence, for example. The next point I wanted to make is that we need to work with other sectors, but also better within protection. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Within protection, for child protection, we need to work better with GBV on case management for child survivors of sexual violence, where we see teenage children and particularly girls at risk. We need to work with mine action for children who are victims of explosive ordinance and require comprehensive case management, including mental health and psychosocial support. So we need to get better working within protection and describing the story, being efficient and coordinated, but also with other sectors. And for example, for child protection, we need to get better at working with education, and we'll hear about that today, hopefully, so that we're not duplicating, we're adding value, so that child protection is able to take referrals and provide more advanced support. We need to get better at working with health as we step up and provide more advanced support into level three, how we work with health actors who may be operating at level four, for example. So we need to do that work at country level and through the technical working groups at country level. This is very important. So as we coordinate our work and get better at working together within protection and with other sectors, that needs to happen through the technical working groups. And Sarah referenced that increase in those coordination groups at country level that we need to plug into. 
it's great that we have global frameworks, but these need to be balanced by country level coordination. And our first focus must be country level coordination. The situations are different in each country, the capacity of different sectors, how we work together, the configuration of line ministries and so on. So focusing at a country level. In child protection, we're going to have a particular focus on sectors such as nutrition, health, education. And we're going to do that through those technical working groups I mentioned. Many of you may know that child protection is often leading psychosocial support groups. And with Cohen, we've been encouraging our child protection colleagues to move to a single platform that is mental health and psychosocial support. So we become part of a comprehensive coordination platform. And I'd like to thank colleagues from BHA for their support in doing that in the coming year. We've got huge amounts to do. We've got a great opportunity right now. We have to challenge ourselves and work together more than ever. I look forward to hearing Cohen and Sarah to the rest of the session and to the panelists. And I wanted to say a big thank you to colleagues at the ISC Reference Group, Sarah to you, to FAMI and others for the great partnership in this work. It's truly valuable and appreciated. Cohen and Sarah, back to you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you also for thanking us. It's nice as well to be thanked. So thank you for doing that. Um, we're now going to have our first panel discussion and we have um, colleagues here from the health area and also from education. So Fatmi Hanna um, from the World Health Organization, who's also my fellow co-chair of the reference group, um, and also Mackenzie, who is a representative from the Global Education um, Cluster as well. And Kuhn is going to moderate this panel session. And please, if you have questions in the chat that you would like to write or comments in the chat to, um, to, to the panelists or in relation to what's happening on the panel in terms of discussions, then please do write them in the chat function because I will be checking that and hopefully feeding it in at the end of the first panel discussion as well. So we welcome your, your inputs as well. Kuhn. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Fami, welcome. Uh, Mackenzie, welcome. Mackenzie, you've been such a champ in um, promoting the cooperation between child protection and education, so it's good that you uh, switch on your camera. Um, and now I'm, I think, ah, there is Fami, you know, these, these, these things. Right? Fantastic. Fami, I'm going to start with Mackenzie. Uh, Mackenzie, um, I have a question for you, and the same question will afterwards also be asked to uh, Fami as well. So how important is actually now at this stage MHPSS in your sector? I'm asking the reality, what is it now really? And how important should it be on the other hand? If you can give an answer in about four minutes, thank you. Yeah, well, MHPSS is already quite central in education. Study after study have shown the positive impact and correlation between um, good child well-being and learning outcomes, attendance at school, peer interaction. So for this reason, the education responses are increasingly including MHPSS. This year in um, all of the HRPs, we calculated 5.8 million children are targeted for MHPSS activities within the education response. Now that's more than half of the total children targeted. So I think that shows um, the importance of these activities within our sector. Um, the reality is also though that while there's an expansion of, of children targeted and reached, there's a plethora of different approaches and different depths of approaches um, in applying the MHPSS activities in education settings. Um, the, this could be uh, MHPSS activities that are integrated into part, the part of um, daily classroom teaching and learning, for example, social, social emotional learning approaches, or standalone um, MHPSS activities happening in the school environment, um, which could be structured or semi-structured or unstructured um, PSS, MHPSS activities. How it should be, um, in my opinion, more coordinated. So remembering that both education and child protection are focusing on the same children, I think there's, there's room to expand and enhance our intersector collaboration to make sure that we're together delivering 
um, a holistic package of MHPSS activities to children and more coherently as well. Um, schools have really unparalleled access to children. Since education is a universal service intended to reach every child in a country, um, this is really a great opportunity that we should leverage to um, reach more children and together achieve our collective MHPSS outcomes since we, since we have that access to children. But at the same time, we need to um, place the school and the school's role within uh, a child's broader environment and link with the other sectors and ser services to reduce the disconnect between the PSS and the MH, with the PSS predominantly is what's provided in schools, but we know that children sometimes need more than that, um, and making sure that the connections both up and down the pyramid layers are, are made and enhanced through, through better collaboration. Um, and, and just a final note on what, what it should be, in my opinion, teachers in schools can't do everything. So we, we do need to um, strengthen that link with other sectors and think realistically about the capacities that schools have, maximize those and also um, support them to be able to serve children better. Thank you, Mackenzie. So uh, MHPSS and education is there. That's good, but it can still be better, right? Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Fami, I think the world should be grateful for all the things that you've been doing in MHPSS. It's, uh, it makes the world a difference, actually. I'm so happy that you wanted to be part of, of this panel, actually. The same questions for you. What is uh, now the importance of MHPSS in, in, in the health sector? Um, and how important should it be as well? Uh, thank you, Fami. Four minutes. Hmm. Thank, thank you very much. And, and thank you for this opportunity. And, uh, and thanks for the appreciation as well, but we did not do this alone. We did it with, uh, with you and with partners from different sectors and, and clusters. And uh, for the purpose of this session, I'm wearing, wearing the hat of health sector, but my job every day is to make sure that mental health and psychosocial support is integrated into all sectors and all clusters and provides the needed support for country level MHPSS technical working group. But let's zoom in together on, on the health on the health sector and health aspects. To what extent it's important, it's, uh, mental health has been, has been there as part of WHO definition for health since it was established in its constitution. The motto of no health without mental health has been raised by WHO for, uh, for, for, for decades. And you look at the sphere uh, principles uh, through, throughout, one of, the, one of the sphere principles has been always within the health uh, component mental uh, mental mental health uh, and that continue to grow across uh, across the year uh, within the health sector there is uh, there is a key indicator of having uh, the percentage of general health care facilities with at least one person trained and the system in place to provide services for people with mental health conditions I worked in Syria, both, uh, both wearing the hat of, of an officer in, uh, in, in Syria, providing technical support and also, also, also globally uh, with, with, with my colleagues in the countries and regions providing support to Syria. And in a country like Syria, this indicator specifically has seen, has seen huge success across uh, the year. Paradoxically, before 2011, this indicator, integration of mental health into general health care, was 0%. We started before the conflict from zero percent. If you look at the health cluster, uh, the health cluster data now, the one which just released back back in uh, back in uh, in last last year in the annual report of Hiram and the health cluster, there is thirty two percent integration. Means that thirty two percent of general health care facilities, starting from zero percent, are providing mental health services for people with severe mental health conditions. They started from two psychiatric hospitals only in 2011 with no integration in community-based centers, in family centers, in schools. But now there are services in 11 cities and outside of the psychiatric hospital and community-based uh, based center. And that happened, happened in Syria. But why it happened in Syria and do not happen in other, other places? Our main problem, Kun, is lack of investment in this area before conflicts and before, before emergencies. Most governments in the world are investing 2% of their healthcare uh, budget on mental, uh, on mental health. 
while one uh, one on uh, in ten thousand, this is the rate of mental health professionals. One in ten would have a mental health condition. One in five in humanitarian situation would have a mental health condition. But we have globally one in uh, ten thousands in low income countries. Two for every hundred thousand. You apply how many mental health professionals are there for a country such as South Sudan, which has seen decades of conflict. There are three mental health professionals for South Sudan in a rate of one for every 12 million. Just imagine the gap. One in uh, one in five people needs a service, but there is one for every for every four million. Our main challenge is lack of investment in community-based mental uh, mental health services within the health sector and other sectors as well before emergencies. We need we need after emergencies to look into building back better, more sustainable mental health care systems. But also we need to think before emergencies into building better before mental health systems for preparedness. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that's a huge gap indeed, actually. It's uh, quite shocking when you were talking about those numbers of uh, South Sudan. That's quite something. Uh, thank, thank you, Fami. Um, Mackenzie, back to you, actually. Um, what would explain the difference between what uh, the situation now is of MHPSS in the education sector and what should be? Uh, how it should be, and then, uh, from in your views, how can it be solved? And afterwards, the same question also for uh, Fami. And um, four minutes, please. Thank you. I think the difference is uh, between what it is now and and what it should and can be, is putting the child at the center and responding to their needs holistically, through multiple sectors and in a joined up way and in a coordinated way. I have three ideas for solutions. Um, first, as I said, uh, strengthening our, our intersector coordination. So child-focused MHPSS delivery requires uh, us to provide a coherent uh, support at different levels of the MHPSS pyramid and referrals in between those levels. So we need to collaborate with different sectors, education, child protection, protection, health, um, to enhance the quality and the coverage. And I think together we can do that. We can capitalize on our complementarities, um, avoid duplication of services. And through doing this, we are maximizing the limited uh, resources and human capacity that we have available and reach more children in need. But that will require us to come together, break the silos and, and work intersectorally what that could look like, what are some of the steps of, of working uh, in an intersector way. Uh, Michael mentioned we need to understand the needs, the MHPSS needs of children, and we need to understand this together. Uh, we could work together in needs assessments uh, or, or coming together, putting all the information that we have from different sectors on the table and analyzing that jointly to come to a, a better picture of, of children's mental health and psychosocial needs. Um, secondly, strategic planning, doing this together, agreeing the roles and responsibilities of our different sectors in responding to those needs and, and dividing those responsibilities in a strategic way. Um, uh, and then targeting. So making sure we're not doing the same activities in the same locations for the same children, but rather um, more strategically uh, dividing the targets and activities to make sure that we're playing to our strengths, maximizing the opportunities and saving resources through, through targeting more efficiently between the different sectors. Um, and I think specifically for education, as we mentioned before, we have such access to children and um, quite often the activities that we're doing at school level are, are in the layer two of the MHPSS pyramid. If we're more collaborative and um, discuss the targeting and plan together with, with child protection, for example, if we're taking on um, a lot of the level two activities in, in MHPSS service delivery, that potentially frees up a lot of resources and space for child protection to provide more specialist services, um, referrals between the layers, case management, things like this that require a lot more resources and, and perhaps more specialized and dedicated um, human resources uh, and, and allowing us to 
to complement that with the wide scale, low level support that's that's feasible through schools. Um, and just for for example, the child protection and education clusters uh, and AOR have have come together to develop a collaboration framework to, to help have some of these discussions and and div d divide roles and responsibilities more strategically. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if I'm out of time, but I have uh, two other solutions that are very short. Uh, if they are very short, you can give them, but of course we need solutions always. Okay. Uh, a second idea for a solution, it, it's really connected to the first, but making sure that um, the responses are joined up, we need to focus on the referral mechanisms between, between the layers, between the sectors, and, and really working together to facilitate that. And, and again, that's part of the intersector collaboration to, to join those dots. Um, and finally, the third solution from the education sector is, is teachers. Um, I think parents and caregivers' well-being is increasingly being discussed and addressed, and we need to do the same thing for teachers because not only is their mental health important in its own right, but let's think about the knock-on effect that um, a teacher with poor mental health would have for the children in, in her or his classroom. Um, I think we, we see more positive classroom management strategies employed, reduced corporal punishment um, in those classrooms. So this should be also front and center in our thinking when uh, we want to affect positive outcomes on child well-being as well. And those are, those are all the solutions I have. Thank, thank you, Mackenzie. I think there are, uh, those are very, very good suggestions. Uh, one thing that came to mind when you were talking as well was when we are uh, moving more BSS activities from child protection into education and child protection will focus more on level three activities is that we will also have to work with a different costing model, right? Now the, the, the financial flow goes to the clusters. How will it work then in the future? Also in the past, you could see in child protection a quite horizontal costing model of 800,000 children times $3 per child for the PSS activities. Now it will be so much money for PSS activities, but then also for level three and so on. And it will be a much more complicated uh, structure. Uh, Fami, you mentioned uh, investment. Uh, so obviously, uh, the explanation between the difference what is and what should be is, is the lack of money and how can it be solved is more money. But I'm sure there's uh, more than that on the table. Uh, Indeed, I, I think resources still still uh, still a big issue and resources, uh, resources also reflected not only in financial but, uh, but human, human resources. Lack of investment does not only mean lack of investment in services but lack of investment in uh, in, in uh, pre-graduate and undergraduate and postgraduate education, which lead to availability of mental health resources that would be working in this area. Kun, let me share with you some findings, very fresh data, just released actually yesterday, which is very relevant to our discussion. Yesterday, WHO released a survey on continuation of mental, neurological, and substance use services in 130 different uh, countries. Some of the findings are really eye-openers eye and very relevant to your question. Actually, out of the 130 countries, 89%, big majority, said that they have included mental health and psychosocial support in their COVID-19 national response plan. Huge majority. Two-thirds of the countries have reported having a multi-sectoral MHPSS coordination platform. Almost 90% of them said Ministry of Health is there. Around 70% said either Social Affairs or Education Ministry is part of this coordination platform. However, but... 17% of those countries that have integrated MHPSS into their plan reported having full funding to implement the activities in the, in the plan. So again, it brings us to the resources issues. When we look at the continuation of the services during COVID-19, a big eye opener here, 93% of the countries reported either whole or partial disruption of services. And guess what? Which services was among the most disrupted? services for the most vulnerable people, children and adolescent uh, services, 
30% of countries only reported full continuation of these services. Similarly, services for older adults. Very similar percentage for services for antenatal uh, and, uh, and, and post postnatal uh, mental health mental health uh, services prevention and promotion services were among the most badly disrupted outpatient and community uh, based services among the most uh, most disrupted so to some extent the recommendation and finding is that there are existing guidance on continuation of essential health services and against disruption and how to continue and have safe delivery for these services that is released and available. And the recommendation from WHO to, to countries, including in humanitarian situations, is to apply uh, this because what we see is, is major disruption in most of the countries in humanitarian and also in non-humanitarian settings and to monitor these changes and also use it for improvement. So we need also data to continue collecting data like uh, like the survey like the survey i just uh, i just i just mentioned i think other other areas which which are needed which will help us to get there is uh, is advocacy uh, mental health can be less prioritized among other areas of work especially uh, in 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 situations where the resources are very are very limited we need to present the service as essential and as sometimes life uh, life life saving and uh, above all as a basic need and a human uh, a human right thank you thank you fabi uh, yes i mean human resources are indeed uh, a very important issue and uh, advocacy is, is is totally needed there um, Sarah, you've been monitoring the chat. Have been has there been, have there been any questions coming out of uh, the people participating? Yes, there. Um, there's been a few reflections, um, particularly on what the panelists said. So good reflections. As they're saying in response to your comment, Mackenzie, for teacher well-being, I think, and the role of teachers as being part of the solution um, as well. And um, also support for what you were saying, family, on the need to invest in human resources, and that needs to be collective capacity building, collective training opportunities, rather than just looking at one cadre of professionals or one type of, of, of officer. And then there's a particular question that's come in and a reflection also from, from Alfred Mutiti, based in Syria. Um, he was saying that the challenge over time has been the medicalization of mental health and psychosocial support with a limited focus on investing in community structures and community-based responses. Um, are we looking at reviewing different approaches to mental health um, and psychosocial support so that we avoid doing harm and we actually start, start doing better um, for, for children and more vulnerable groups? If I remember having discussions with family about that topic as well, family, I'm sure you have things to say about that. Well, I think it is wrong to think about mental health and psychosocial support as a matter relevant to one sector or one cluster. This is a cross-cutting subject. In good humanitarian practice, you will find MHPSS actors working under child protection. Good MHPSS practice, you will find MHPSS actors working in education sector, doing school, uh, school mental health uh, uh, promotion in nutrition sector, doing behavioral activation for children with severe malnutrition and many other activities within general protection clusters, within health sector, doing mental health integration into general health care. I think, I think the mistake happened in coordination at country level if MHPSS is taken or dominated by one sector only. Whatever is this sector, this is a subject which is cross-cutting and there need to be a balance through having MHPSS technical working groups which are not belonging to one sector or one cluster which are cross-cutting with good representation and good services happening within different sectors and different uh, and different clusters. Also, another, another solution for what the colleague from Syria has proposed is uh, using cost-effective methods. And the survey that I just uh, shared released yesterday, we found that above 80% of countries are using uh, telehealth or uh, teletherapy as, as an intervention, which, which is very good, which is less used in low-income settings. But what we found is actually less used is tools which have been advocated for for years, such as task sharing by building the capacity of general health workers to do things that specialists can uh, can can do we find very very 
smaller percentage compared compared to tele teletherapy and tele telehealth intervention invested in task uh, task sharing. So getting getting back again that there are things that can be done by community based uh, health uh, health work and and uh, and community and community workers in general. Things that can be done by teachers. There are things that can be done through task sharing where uh, a more multi sectoral multi disciplinary approach can be introduced at case level. Mm, thank you, thank you, Fanny. Uh, Sarah? Yes, there's time for, I think, for one more question from Sharon Abramovich. I apologize if I've got your name wrong, Sharon. Um, she was asking um, if we could reflect on how mental health and psychosocial support is being integrated into risk communication and community engagement, RCCE, um, in specifically in relation to COVID. So how MHPSS is integrated into risk communication and community engagement. Who wants to comment? Mackenzie, Fami? I see Fami clicking sure. yes. Okay, Fami, go ahead then. Just want to say that MHPSS is cross-cutting across sectors. And MHPSS is cross-cutting in public health emergency responses within sectors as well. So it means that within the health sector, MHPSS should be seen also as a cross-cutting subject, not only relevant to risk communication, but also relevant to clinical management, because there are mental and neurological manifestation of COVID disease itself. It have it have mental and neurological consequences, which which are known clinically. Risk communication. There are things that we can do for stress uh, management. There are things that we can do in community messages that we need to integrate MHPSS into. In public health emergencies, there is a pillar for partner coordination. MHPSS is relevant there as well. In amid public health emergencies, there is another pillar for operations where there is a duty of care for all staff working. So MHPSS is cross-cutting across sectors and MHPSS usually is cross-cutting also within sector of relevant to different sectors. So when it comes to risk communication and community engagement, there is a published WHO guidance since uh, February available in uh, numerous uh, languages in all six UN languages on WHO uh, on risk communication and community, community engagement. Uh, including the messages that can be used and, and, and I saw it used creatively, especially in humanitarian settings in developing messages uh, using WhatsApp for dissemination of messages in very difficult to reach areas. And also uh, WHO released a stress management uh, guide, an illustrated guide for, uh, for self-help that can be used by uh, frontline uh, responders and can be used also by, uh, by, by individual. But just want to emphasize that it's relevant for risk communication as well as it is relevant for other pillars within any public health emergency response. Thank you. Thank you, Fami. Uh, Mackenzie, I see that you're unmuted. Do you want to add quickly something to that before we move on to the next topic? And just quickly for from education, again, what a what a great opportunity to to integrate. We've seen um, fantastic examples of um, MHPSS messaging going out together with other risk uh, education messaging through the distance learning modalities. So um, a fantastic avenue to to reach the ears and minds of children um, when these systems have, have been set up for the remote uh, education distance learning. Um, and there's been some really, really good examples coming through of including MHPSS messaging within those broadcasts, um, as well as, as RCCE to school Thank children. You. Thank you, Mackenzie. Thank you so much for participating in this panel today. Also, thank you, Fami. Thank you so much for your time and for your valuable input. There have been very uh, interesting comments as well in the chat box, but I leave it up to all of you to read it. And we can uh, move on to the next point on our agenda, which is an interview with uh, Pat from uh, OFTA USAID, and that's in the hands of Sarah. Sarah, over to you. And thank you again, panelists. Thank you, Kun, and hello, Elizabeth, as well. Hello, um, Sarah. With regards to the questions in the chat, I think we will also come back to them in subsequent panels because some of them are not specific just to health or protection or education. So we will um, come back and also the panelists feel free to respond to any questions that come up in the chat as well. Okay. Um, hello, Elizabeth again, sorry. <laughs> Um, you um, are the uh, psychosocial um, and protection focal person um, within the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance at the USAID, um, yourself and, and other colleagues. 
what portfolio of projects or programs do you oversee in, in that position? Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here today to, to participate in the session alongside my colleagues from the Mental Health and Psychosocial Reference Group, uh, the Child Protection Area of Responsibility, and to all of you who are showing an interest today um, in mental health and psychosocial support. It's great to see this highlighted on the agenda of the Global Protection Forum this year. Um, for me, for the USA Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, formerly known as OFTA, um, Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance and Food for Peace, we recently transitioned. Our mission is to save lives, alleviate human suffering, and decrease the economic impact of disasters. And as part of this mission, BHA supports activities in all humanitarian responses to address the critical mental health and psychosocial needs of persons exposed to stressors during conflict or crisis. Within BHA, advisors such as myself lead humanitarian protection programming, interagency coordination, and U.S. government policy engagement across the sectors of gender-based violence, child protection, psychosocial support, and protection coordination advocacy and information. In addition, our work is to support technical leadership, guidance, and policy development to promote gender equality and integrate gender, age, disability, and social inclusion in programming. The work is also to ensure protection remains central to all of our response programming through safe programming, accountability of populations, and protection from sexual exploitation and abuse. A core part of this work uh, is to ensure program safety, which takes into account the physical as well as psychological aspects of disasters. This is a core component, um, core uh, aspect of our programming that we do not take lightly. And um, throughout the years, we've done more and more in the area of MHPSS. So what does this mean for um, my portfolio or the work that myself and my colleagues do? We review every single proposal that comes into the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance to ensure that partners meet requirements. In the last year, that um, included over approximately 700 proposals from across the globe. This, um, all programming did not, obviously a part of that included mental health and psychosocial, um, but we do look for those, those aspects in there. The team proactively engages with the protection coordination bodies, such as yourself that are here today, um, the MHPSS reference group, the Child Protection and Gender-Based Violence AOR, um, and the Global Protection uh, Cluster. And we do this to ensure the development of protection policy, tools and guidance, which are responsive to emerging protection needs at the field level. So given the importance of psychosocial support to USAID's protection programming, USAID is investing in new tools, modalities, and standards for MHPSS that can provide humanitarian actors with interventions that can safely be deployed at scale in culturally diverse and resource challenged environments. Some of the activities that we, um, that I and others in um, BHA cover include when it comes to MHPSS, um, on the psychosocial side, examples are group and peer based activities, as well as recreational, social, and emotional learning activities. Our global level, level projects um, also include examples such as the World Health Organization Problem Management Plus Project, which provides peer professionals with the training they need to provide focus group interventions designed to reduce levels of social and emotional distress during the aftermath of an emergency. Um, this also includes, you were talking earlier about community-based, the need for more community-based mental health and psychosocial support. One of the projects that we supported um, was the really recently released um, by IOM manual on community-based mental health and psychosocial support. Another uh, example of our project of the pr programs that we do is um, we supported the IRC's Women Rise project, which um, included a psych was a psychosocial framework and resource package for gender-based violence programs. Also, a reintegration package for children associated with armed groups and forces that included a psychosocial component as case workers and social workers provide support to families and children and the reintegration process. 
An upcoming project that we are also um, incredibly happy to support is with the IFRC Psychosocial Center um, and the development of an integrated model for supervision, supervision, which will provide guidance for supervision of staff and volunteers implementing mental health and psychosocial support protection interventions in emergencies. So that's a little, <laughs> a little taste of what um, we cover. There's even more, but I'll stop there. Great. Well, you sound very busy having to review 700 um, proposals. You're a very popular um, government. And I know that you do a lot of um, work and offer financial, but also the diplomatic support, like you said, supporting protection policy initiatives um, as well as direct programming. So it's a, it's a nice balance that you see. Um, and as a, as, a, as a donor agency and one that's been very consistent, both for the protection sector, but also with regards to mental health and psychosocial support, as, as, a, as a consistent and, and, and knowledgeable donor here with a, with a considerable size of funding, um, as well and support that you give to the humanitarian system, as well as for refugee and migration response. Um, how, how, how do you see a good proposal um, and is there something in particular that you that you look for in terms of um, cross sectoral or um, work or or trying to bridge across different clusters or different sectors as well? Absolutely. So first and foremost, for our global core, um, programs, we look to fill critical gaps of the reference group and the agreement of uh, the AORs. Um, and that is looking at our, those as the coordination bodies um, that are working with all the implementing organizations to identify the biggest needs on the ground. So we're really at our global level looking at filling those critical gaps. Um, we want to, all of our program, we're looking to align the global technical bodies. Um, outside of this, we look to support programs to meet global need, not just in building capacity of an organization, but connected to the broader community of practice. Um, we also, when I'm looking at a proposal, I'm looking to ensure that it is in line with the CHA application guidelines. We just re recently released um, a new version of this, which you can find on our USAID website. Um, and this is for all our non-competitive -com emergency awards for NGOs. Um, these guidelines are written in line with the global guidance um, that is released by the IASC guidelines on MHPSS and emergencies when it, we're talking about emergency proposals um, or MHPSS proposals. And so I'm looking to make sure when I'm addressing uh, reviewing proposals that it's in line with both of these things. Some of the main considerations to highlight from, because there's such a well, depth and wealth of information in those guidance documents, is also that programming should focus on activities that span across the mental health and psychosocial intervention pyramid. For BHA, this will mean, as we were talking before, about not wanting to stove that type things, but this means for us that often it goes across the health and protection sectors. So we're looking to see, ideally, that programs show both of those sectors and how the MHPSS work is crossing both of those. Um, we're also looking to see that it's placed um, based on internationally recognized evidence-based strategies that reinforce the essential to disaster response. This includes standalone life-saving protection activities, preparedness, and disaster risk reduction. That's our mandate for um, BHA, so we're making sure that it's in that area. We also are looking to ensure MHPSS programming is coordinated across the sectors. This is the idea of our session today, but we that is one of our core pieces that we look for. In many cases, psychosocial programming will intersect with and complement programming in other sectors and subsectors, both internal and external to protection. Um, so some of the th other things we look for with that is that there's a clear referral pathway. So for individuals identified through psychosocial programs that are in need of more intensive mental health care, we're looking at those referral pathways are there and vice versa. We also want to avoid awareness raising in programs. Sometimes we've seen this um, in some of our uh, the applications that we get. We want to avoid awareness raising that is not alongside, that is not, that does not have, um, it can't be done in the absence of services. So absolutely needing both of those things to be there. In addition, clinical diagnosis and management should be provided by trained, supervised clinicians. We want to make sure that staff that are that our organizations that we're supporting to do the MHPSS work 
are um, fully staffing these programs, fully supporting those who are trained um, to have that supervision and support that's needed. Uh, just a couple of two po um, points on that, two more points. Um, so for we're talking about training, we really want to ensure that the training, supervision, and mentorship of generalists, paraprofessionals, and community workers by, are available by specialists and trained experience providers. Um, we have seen this um, also in the need, earlier we were talking about the need for more community-based psychosocial support. So that's something we're looking to in our proposals also. Wanting to, to ensure that community-based psychosocial support is focused on building and establishing positive coping mechanisms, increasing social cohesion, and strengthening community resilience. What are, what do communities, what are the strengths they already have? What are the, the th things already in place that can be reinforced with these programs and not um, left out of our activities. So that is just a few highlights. There's so much more I could go into, but <laughs> I know we're short. And <laughs> Thank you. And it's, it's, a, it's really a pleasure to see um, a, a, a donor government agency that also understands the importance of human resources in, in this area, both for protection, but also health and uh, education and MHPSS and the need that, that families and individuals who are vulnerable and communities and who are requiring support in emergencies, that they get that accompaniment um, and that you are able to refer and, and provide them with the service that they are actually seeking rather than saying this isn't my responsibility any longer. Um, so thank you for reinforcing that point um, as well. Um, there's something that's come up in the chat function that I can just directly ask you now, Elizabeth. It's um, in relation to all the programs that, that um, BHA supports. Um, is there a link where people can learn more about the types of programs or initiatives or projects that you support? Um, and also in particular, the, the, the new guidelines that you mentioned that you'd released on, on how you review your applications. Absolutely. And I will um, put in after, right after this, the interview. I'll put in the link to where our guidelines are. Um, you also find fact sheets on the different um, activities that have happened across the different sectors, including protection, health. Um, you can find more on our website. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and thank you for your time today also to talk about the work of BHA. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. This was good. This was very informative, actually. I think everybody should be interested in how to write successful uh, proposals. Yes. Um, yes, Sarah, we have a quiz. It's going to be a fascinating quiz. Yes. We don't have big prizes, but we have... <laughs> we have no prizes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> in full <laughs> transparency. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And uh, we actually have two Zoom masters, Sonia and Blanca, which I also would like to thank now that we are on the topic as well. And they're going to give you the first uh, question and you can then uh, give answers in the form of a poll. Yes, so I promise to read the questions out um, for all of you. So the first question, there's going to be four on this quiz. So the first question is, is the creation of a psychosocial support working group in which you invite different sectors a good way forward? And you have two options, either yes or no. And you have 10 seconds to reply. Mm. Five, four, three, two, one. Yes, Sonia. Ah, voilà. So there we have the result. The majority of the people answered, yes, it is a good way forward. And I can understand why you would say that, uh, because it says you invite different sectors, right? However, the correct answer is no. It was a bit tricky because we're talking here about a PSS working group. The right answer would have been, we have to create an MHPSS working group, not a PSS working group. Um, we are struggling currently because in several countries there are separate mental health and PSS working groups 
and we really need to unite the image and the PSS working groups. So it is not a good way forward to create a PSS working group, even if you invite different sectors. It should be an image PSS working group. Sorry for being so tricky, but for now we can keep our price, right? Okay, Sonia, next question, please. Okay, question number two is can stress management strategies for young mothers reduce acute malnutrition in children? Again, two options, either yes or no. And you have 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, and there we go. Sonia, the results, please. Yes, so the majority of the people say yes. I, I forgot to say that this question was not related to any price, right? The right answer is yes, actually. So most of you are right. Stress can uh, stop the production of uh, breast milk and with targeted uh, MHPSS interventions, we can actually reactivate the breast milk production. And as such, we have a big role to play in uh, malnutrition uh, as well. Thank you. Sonia, number three, please. Okay, you notice the questions are getting a bit longer now. So the question number three is for clusterized countries, so this is for IDP settings, what would be the impact in terms of the number of beneficiaries of level two activities if, if child protection would consistently work together with education? So by level two activities, it's referring to level two of the um, ISC intervention pyramid, which is family and community supports. So what would be the impact if child protection and education work together to deliver level two family and community support interventions? And you, sorry, you have three options here, numbers of percentages. Exactly. You have 10 seconds left. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you, Sonia, the results, please. Okay, so 24% of our participants says 50%, 55% uh, uh, said that the number of children reached would increase with 80%, and 20% of our uh, participants would uh, say that it would increase with 100 percent. The 20 percent of our participants are right. The number of children reached if we would work consistently together with education, it would increase with 100 percent. Uh, now child protection is reaching 5,320,017 children exactly on level two services, that's the HRP of 2019, while education in emergencies has 10.8 million. With other words, if we work consistently with education, we can double the amount of children that we read. So it's really uh, worth doing that. Um, yeah, we still cannot give our car away, right, that we had in Petal. Question four, please, Sonia. Okay, question four. This is the last question for you. Which way should referrals take place between service providers according to the ISC uh, MHPSS intervention pyramid? So upwards from level one and two to levels three and four, downwards from level four to the other three levels, sideways within layers or all of the above. So four options there. Every time more options are good, it's the last question. Uh, we have 10 seconds to go. Four, three, two, one, zero. Then here comes the result. 21% um, said option one, but indeed uh, all of the above is the right answer and 62% is the amount, is the percentage of participants that gave the right action. It is manifest thing that we always need to refer up basically, but um, there is an issue as well that up the psychologists and so they, they're having a bottleneck with services and unless they start referring down then we also cannot fill the gap that that family was talking about uh, so they should also refer down and uh, 
We also should also refer sideways, right, Sarah? Uh, and what is that again? Yes, so sideways is your organization may not be the person providing all of the different types of activities within, say, layer two or within, say, layer three. But you may have another organization that's providing similar activities. So you can also refer and accompany, as um, Elizabeth mentioned in, in, in the interview beforehand. Um, so ref there's no one direction for referrals. It should be a very dynamic way through all the different layers of the pyramid. And we should really be thinking about pulling in holistic supports for a family or for an individual in need. It doesn't really matter what layer of the pyramid you operate in. The, the fact is you need to pull in services to help that, that particular person or that family in front of you that's, that's in need. Um, so it, you can also, as I said, go sideways, look at fellow organizations providing similar services that might be able to help you, as well as referring to specialized services, as well as referring to, to things like shelter and basic needs as well. Thank you for the clarification, Sarah. Uh, and I think actually everybody involved did very well in, in the quiz. Thank you so much for participating in that. Um, Sarah, if I'm not mistaken, then the next chapter of this webinar is in your hands and you're going to do a panel discussion with uh, Megan from uh, GPV, with Cecile from uh, the nutrition uh, sector and with Murat from Mine Action. That's going to be fascinating. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Kun. And could I please invite um, Cecile, Murat, um, and Megan to please put their cameras on so we can see you. So hello, friends and colleagues. Murat, I can't find you. Uh, hello, can you? Uh, yes, now I can. Yes. Okay, great. I can. Great, thank you. Okay, so similar to the um, panelists that we had before, um, I'm going to ask you each of you two questions and it's the same question that we will take in turns across the different um, sectors in this case. So the first question um, is how important is mental health and psychosocial support um, in reality um, in your particular sector or area of work and how important should it be? Okay, so we can start off with um, Cecile from uh, Nutrition. You're actually an MHPSS colleague, but I know you straddle nutrition very well. And then we'll go on to Megan and GBV and then Murat and Mine Action. Yeah, maybe it's part of the challenge and the solution is about how, as a mental health specialist, you become a nutrition expert. <laughs> so I, I think there are many, many uh, uh, links between nutrition and MHPSS. So I will. Uh, Maybe just start by, I won't explain all of them, maybe during the question we can go a bit further, but maybe I would like to start by um, why we started in action against hunger to work on MHPSS, because I think it's a good example of why, why there is um, linkages between the two. So it was a long time ago in Congo Brazzaville where we had some um, treatment for uh, malnourished people. Uh, it was a huge crisis and we get some people coming directly, directly from the bush into the nutrition centers. But when in the nutrition center, some of the people didn't want to take any of uh, drugs or protocols to be nourished again. They... Cecile, we seem to have lost her. Cecile, we're going to come back to you. Um, and Megan, I will jump the question to you now instead as GBV. Sure, no problem. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay, great. So um, I, it's, a, it's a really interesting how important um, MHPSS is to the GBV sector. It's, it is foundational um, to our sector. And I think that is um, both um, what we want it to be, but also the reality. Um, so I just wanna talk a little bit about some of our interventions, um, you know, that, that are MHPSS interventions. Um, so case management, which in most GBV programs is not just targeting GBV survivors, but is also a service that is available for all women and girls um, that want to access it. Um, you know, this is a level three intervention um, and it is, it's really the foundational part of any GBV program. Um, we also, um, most of our um, services in our, in our sector, both case management, but other types of level two psychosocial activities are provided within women and girls safe spaces. 
Um, and these are really, you know, a women and girls safe space is not just a space, um, you know, for, for women and girls to come together um, and sort of a physical um, location um, that houses PSS activities, but we also consider it to be a PSS intervention in itself because of the, um, the, the safety, the psychological and emotional safety it can provide women and girls, um, as well as it being um, an entry point for services, for other MHPSS ser services, um, but that piece around kind of also helping to reduce isolation um, and bring women and girls together um, to be able to connect um, is, is really important um, for women and girls safe spaces as an intervention. Um, and then, you know, many of the activities, as I mentioned, that we do within women and girls safe spaces and often in coordination with other sectors um, are level two activities um, on the pyramid. So um, it could be very informal um, discussions with women and girls. Um, sometimes that's tea and coffee sessions. Sometimes it's livelihoods activities where we're um, working with, um, you know, the livelihood sector as well. Um, one um, kind of new piece that we're really excited about in this sector, um, and sorry, I should say before that, that many of our programs and organizations also provide in their programs um, higher level, level three um, group psychosocial interventions. Um, and this next thing that I want to talk about is um, really, really excited that OFDA or BHA, um, US government is funding is the development um, of a, a resource package to support GBV practitioners um, with the implementation of level three group PSS interventions for women. Um, and that also includes a specific curriculum that, um, that IRC um, has developed and has been piloted um, and adapted in several contexts. So that's something that's gonna be coming out in the spring of 2021. Um, and, uh, I don't know if I'm running out of time, but, <laughs> um, you have 30 more seconds, Megan. I have 30 <laughs> seconds. Okay. Yeah. I, I will just, I'm going to sort of say, sort of, uh, plant a seed for my answer to the second question, which is just that, um, not only is, um, MHPSS so foundational to the GBV sector, but the way in which we provide it. Um, and I'll talk about that later, um, is so critical. It's a very specific approach. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Megan. And Cecile, welcome back. We were listening to your beautiful story in West Africa for the, the start of, of ACF and your nutrition programming there. So welcome back and please continue. Thank you. This was a teasing, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's like Netflix. Okay, so just to say that, uh, yes, what was happening was that the, the people, I don't know where it cuts exactly, but the, the person were coming in the nutrition centers and refusing to take the treatment or committing, uh, willing to commit suicide or also uh, being prostrated. So the nutrition team were asking what we can do to support them and also to be capable to, to nourish them. So maybe this is the first thing between the nutrition in MHPSS is that both of them are talking about willing to be alive and willing to get appetite and willing to have life. So I think there is a clear connection between them and maybe one of the challenges that we have now in emergencies and um, in, uh, in the way that we are working is that we are becoming very, very technical persons. So capable to explain how many kilocalories you should uh, take every day, but uh, uh, or, or which type of uh, clinical protocol you should uh, put in place. But maybe we forget sometimes to have something that is more holistic and maybe a more global approach about uh, human being and uh, social beings that we are if, that we have in front of us. So maybe it's where we, I can see a lot of, of connections between the nutrition and MHPSS to um, give life again, give the, the, the wish to be in connection again, and this kind of thing that we can work on together. Uh, so this, again, all the, the multi-sectorial component is very important on this. So this is 
also where I can see that there is connection between the way that we look at the things. So if we are talking, we were talking just before about breastfeeding or we are talking about children and um, what does it mean to nourish or to breastfeed your baby, for example, when it's not a baby that you were willing to have or when you are feeling depressed yourself. So this is the types of work where we really try to work together with the nutrition and with the MHPSS. So meaning that we need to be capable to, to put together knowledge that are coming from different spaces together and to learn from each other. And this is one of the issues also is to know how we can explain and share vocabulary, share knowledge uh, through different disciplines. So maybe it's one of the things that we are talking, working on. So just to give you an example, for example, when we look at, uh, at uh, severe acute malnutrition as psychologists, we can see severe acute malnutrition as one of the consequences of neglect and that the, the malnutrition is only one of the consequences of this. It's not for all the cases, but it's something that we know we learn during the studies that is coming from far uh, in, in the psychology, child psychology, but it's not something that is known by the nutritionist. So we, we try to adjust these kind of things and in the type of project that we do, we, work, uh, we try to work on all these maternal mental health um, uh, programs in uh, mother-child or parent-child relationship uh, on also all the child mental health. We didn't speak so much up to now about very young child uh, mental health, but for sure this is one of the very important things that we are working on uh, when we are talking about nutrition is all the support that we can provide with family when there is pregnant woman and also with the families with very young children. So this is types of things that we are working on. The other thing was also mentioned by Fermi before. We work a lot on uh, behavior activation in nutrition and uh, how to, to make sure that uh, we adapt good methodology in terms of behavior change. And this is coming from more the so social psychology uh, that we use to be able to apply the good, um, um, good uh, ways or good factors that can uh, help in terms of nutrition. There is also some other uh, factors that we are less working on, for example, all the links that are going between micro deficiencies and mental health. Uh, as an example, if you have some uh, iodine deficiency in a country, uh, it, you have a stronger risk to have uh, children with cretinism. So it was something that we observed, for example, in, um, in Afghanistan through the nutrition survey. We found out that there is a lot of women with have a goiter because of iodine deficiency. And uh, many children were uh, uh, born with uh, cretinism. And in that type of situation, you are working, for example, to provide some uh, salt in order to prevent cretinism. So this is another way to work together between nutrition and MHPSS. So it's huge. I can give you <laughs> yeah. example for hours, uh, but <laughs> it's just to, to give you some uh, few examples of how we can work together. Okay, thank you very much, Cecile. And Murat is a person from the Mine Action community. You're very lucky in that you have an international convention actually that includes um, MHPSS. But um, how important is it to the work of Mine Action? Um, how, how important should it be and how important is it in, in reality? If I can give you three minutes to talk. Murat, you're on mute. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I was just saying um, thank you for having invited me and I just wanted to also thank all the previous speakers um, who I've been listening to uh, with great interest. Um, so it seems like a very simple question you're asking. I will try to give a simple and straightforward answer on behalf of the Mine Action AOR, but actually I do find it quite a complex subject to tackle. Um, first of all, um, I think it's good that um, we always remind ourselves the place of mine action within the overall protection sector. And I'm very glad to see William online here. Um, um, and in that sense, what I would like to say is that having listened to colleagues from, uh, from, from the GBV area responsibility, child protection, education, nutrition, in the same way that people facing um, 
needs and concerns, protection or otherwise related to those areas of responsibility or clusters, the same way that those people um, of concern do appear and have um, uh, MHPSA's needs clearly, um, the same does apply to persons of concern to my inaction. And I would say in a very particular way, um, I think as a sector, um, there's very little doubt about the direct and indirect physical and psychological impact of explosive ordnance contamination and explosive violence at various levels. And when I was just thinking about um, this question, I thought it was worthwhile to kind of relate that to what we see actually in the MHPSS guidelines themselves. Um, they speak of uh, emergency-induced social problems or emergency-induced psychological problems. Well, and I also I noted previous colleagues, especially Fahmi, talking about disruption of services, access, or, 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 or in the education sector, schools. So um, from our point of view, there is um, the, the, the impact on uh, social networks, community structures, access to resources or facilities is terribly impacted by the presence of, of uh, explosive ordnance contamination, and this has knock-on effects. Then on the other side, when we talk of psychological problems induced by explosive ordnance, we're talking about all of these issues that we see there, talking about grief, depression, anxiety disorders, including PTSD and other conditions. Now, those are the kind of problems we're talking about, but then let's talk about the persons of concern to mine action at risk of these problems. We've seen hundreds of thousands of recorded incidents and accidents over the decades, um, killing and maiming um, innocent civilians. Um, who are they? So what is being left behind and what are we seeing? These are persons left with physical impairments, with disabilities induced by explosive violence. Um, we're talking about children, uh, child victims. By the way, uh, uh, tragically speaking, the statistics over the past decade has shown that even while there has been a decrease in, in some of the years um, previously in, in overall accidents or incidents, the, the rate of children, child casualties has been on the rise and, and has continued to be. Um, and, and let's not forget that for every parent um, injured or killed, um, there are children affected, there are children orphaned, there are children who continue to work out of no will of their own in, in hazardous areas. There are children who uh, suffer accidents, are knocked out of social, cultural, and educational life as they once knew it if they once knew it. Um, and uh, we talk about women, widows, single mothers, uh, that also, uh, as a cause of, of, of this, of this um, let's say, horror, um, men who have lost the ability to take care of their families, um, and, and the list goes on. So from, from the mine action perspective, I think there's little doubt, and, and referring back to what I noted from from what uh, was mentioned by our colleague Fami, no health without mental health. That really stuck, sticks with me. And, and that's very important because it's hard to talk about recovery or, phys or, or increasing personal capacity of, of the victims um, without the mental health dimension. Um, um, of course, um, why it also should be important is because by nature of these problems and impacts that I've just mentioned and the persons at risk or who've already been impacted, the response has to require cross-sectoral planning in order to, on the one hand, prevent and reduce risks. I mean, the best cure is prevention for any um, issue. We do believe that's why clearance, risk reduction, risk education continues to be a very important uh, part of any humanitarian response as far as the mine action sector is concerned. But at the same time, um, the reality is that prevention is not 100% successful, but far from it. So the issue of needing to respond to the needs, and by the way, short, medium, and long-term needs of victims, of which MHPSS is an integral part, is, is an integral part of what is defined as victim assistance within mine action and among the pillars. So um, 
Okay, um, can I just stop you there, Morat? Because yes. I'm going to give you another question to answer as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the second question, which is also for all panelists, and you actually started answering a little bit of it, Morat, as well, when you in your first response, is um, why do you think that MHPSS has struggled um, to gain traction, and particularly within your sector, if it has indeed struggled? Um, what's it competing against? And also, what do you see as solutions? How can we better integrate it within the work of that particular sector? So I will do the same um, flow as before. So starting, um, Cecile, with nutrition, and hopefully we'll get the full nutrition, not the Netflix highlighted version. <laughs> yeah, I will do my best. <laughs> hey, you've got three minutes to answer. Okay. Okay. Um, but I think one of the first issues, as I was mentioning, is that both uh, sectors, or I don't know how to call them, are, are huge and there is a lot of connection. So it's not easy to have uh, uh, easy protocols or easy explanation about what should be done or what should be not done. Um, the second issue regarding this is also the cultural adaptation. We didn't speak so much about it up to now. Uh, but for me, this is for sure that when we are talking about MHPSS, there is really some uh, contextual adaptation that should be done. And uh, I'm not sure that we can apply some uh, protocol or uh, generic approach that are working everywhere. And there is a long time to, to adapt what we propose to, to, the, to the population. Uh, and linked to this, uh, at the beginning of the session, we were discussing about indicators. And I think it's also an issue, even if um, I, I do believe that in MHPSS, we are quite good in, uh, in indicators, but we are maybe uh, better at the top of the pyramid as a, at the uh, bottom of the pyramid. And it's somewhere where we, we need maybe to, to think about how we can increase and improve the work that we do uh, to be better um, on this and to show more. Uh, on this, we are also, I guess, much more challenged than the other sectors to, to provide indicators when I see what's happened to my colleagues in WASH or nutrition. But it is uh, how it is, so we, we should continue to, to do evidence based on this. Uh, I do agree as well on uh, the questions of uh, uh, funds, but also in terms of multisectoriality, because I think that everybody is talking about multisectoriality and saying how important it is. But when you start to work on funds, for example, uh, you find out that many donors are talking to you about, no, but this is a proposal for nutrition, so you cannot include MHPSS. Or when you do MHPSS, they tell you, okay, but uh, you cannot include something that is nutrition. Uh, and as an example, uh, we do, for example, baby friendly spaces when, where we have integrated early child development, MHPSS, nutrition, health, and we never know to which donor we can provide, uh, we can uh, ask the funds because it's everywhere and nowhere at the same time. So this is a type of uh, a challenge that, uh, that we face as well as um, also the, the, the questions of human resources on the field. It has been also highlighted by uh, FAMI, but the question on which tasks can be proposed to some other uh, professionals and what should be still uh, in the hand of uh, mental health professional is uh, concretely an issue. And I think there is a burden of the health systems when we are working in uh, low and middle uh, income countries. Uh, we, we have the tendency to ask them to do everything, nutrition, mm -hmm. mental health, and all the health, and yes. it's very challenging. So it's in the same time an opportunity to try to see how we can integrate MHPSS and nutrition, for example, within the health system, but it's also a, a big challenge. And I was quite agree with one of the comments that I saw about the risks of uh, psychiatrization or medicalization of mental health. And I think that we should keep this in mind also when we think about uh, uh, health system strengthening and not to forget all the work that can be done also within the communities and with the peer group support or with the helpers and with also patient experts. So I think there are many other options that maybe we don't, uh, we don't target enough yet. Yeah. Thank you, Cecile. 
Megan, over to you. I'm from a GBV perspective, and you're, you have to explain your little taster you gave us before. Yeah. It's a solution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I think that, you know, one of our, our biggest challenges is, is really more um, having other MHPSS actors and other sectors recognize the expertise we bring um, to providing um, MHPSS services to women and girls. And also remind, like keeping it um, uh, communicating and, and having um, other actors understand that the services we provide are not just for GBV survivors, but really are accessible and applicable to, to any, to all women and girls. Um, and what I was starting to reference before is just that we do take a very particular approach in our sector, which is um, a feminist approach to providing PSS, um, MHPSS services. So it's very much rooted in a power analysis, um, very much rooted in um, the lived experiences of women and girls, many of which, you know, are, many of whom are facing violence, but other types of stressors in their lives, um, just by the nature of being a woman and a girl um, in a displaced setting. Um, and, you know, that we not only support healing and recovery from specific incidents of GBV or, or trauma or stress, um, but also all of the other, you know, activities, um, whether that be level two or level three, um, really take an empowerment and approach as well. Um, so I think that, you know, our biggest challenge is, is really getting um, other actors to refer um, uh, to, to us for services for women and girls and really, um, you know, understanding um, why we're um, as a sector best place to provide those services. Um, I think just one other, one other yeah. piece, if I have time, yes, that, you do. Yeah. That, I would, Quickly, yeah, yeah. that I would just mention is um, just to speak to some of the other um, pieces that are coming up around donors and donor advocacy. Um, I think we struggle, and I, I guess that this is not specific to the GBV sector, but I do think we struggle sometimes um, to, uh, to um, get approval from donors for level two activities um, because, you know, they, they aren't as um, quantifiable, right, with indicators um, in terms of improvement and well-being, um, and, and it takes a lot of... Um, resources to be able to monitor and evaluate that. So I think just a plug for um, really us as a intersectoral sector in the MHPSS community, really advocating for the importance of those, you know, of those level two um, activities um, that are often community-based is, is quite important. Okay, thank you very much, Megan. It's interesting that actually the issue to do with human resources has come up a lot in education and health and also um, nutrition and now also with GBV. Um, so also using resources within other areas, like you mentioned, Megan's referring to GBV actors for women and girls, but also working with teachers or also seeing the role of a nutritionist or someone working within a mother and baby space to also be able to provide MHPSS services. And um, Murat, from a mine action perspective then, um, what do you see as, as the solutions to, to better provide MHPSS services um, as part of victim assistance? We've got three minutes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was very um, interested to note, I believe also from the participants, and this is where I very much agree with them, there was a few um, uh, contributions around the HRP and indicators and the question of, of dedicated um, uh, planning. Now, uh, from, from, from my perspective, also as someone who's been working over the past, let's say, nine months on, uh, around collective outcomes that have actually been agreed by, um, uh, by the child protection, mine action, and, and education clusters and AORs, um, um, looking at, I think, what, what I've found as at what we've collectively been looking at as a potential solution is the question of um, um, intentionality, if I can summarize it in one word. So intentionality in the sense that we really, I think, um, can make a difference by 
targeted assessments and evaluation of needs, um, providing dedicated response indicators in the, in the HRPs, articulating these properly in the HNOs, and uh, providing for dedicated budgeting and resource planning, which will allow for a, an accountable approach in reporting also for the mine action sector. So obviously MHPSS needs and requirements are vast and they cut across all of the, the various AORs and, and sectors that have been represented today, as it does for mine action. From a mine action perspective, what will be helpful is if we can really um, articulate uh, specifically um, the, the, the needs and resource requirements for services for MHPSS services to reach explosive ordnance related victims, either direct or indirect. So in a nutshell, in the, in, in, for the, in the interest of time, I'll leave it at that. But I think that was one main point I would like to get across as someone who's also been trying to extend within the framework of GPC support mm. field during the HPC. And I know Sarah, that I thank you also. I take this opportunity to thank you for your support as well. Um, on some of those contexts to, tr to try to see how that can happen in collaboration with our colleagues in the field. So thank you and over to you. Thank you, Murat, as well. So intentionality and uh, asking for money, putting it in the HNOs and putting it in the HRPs um, is important for victim assistance within Mine Action. Kuhn, what's been happening on the chat? Well, um, we are moving now into the second hour, or a good part in the second hour, so people uh, start not to put so many things in the chat. But we got an interesting question, actually, from Magnus from South Sudan, uh, for, uh, for Megan, regarding how the sector works with men and boys. And uh, she says, since the stress is very much, the focus is very much on women and girl-friendly spaces, how to make this inclusive for boys and men? Megan, do you want to react to that? Um, <clears throat> sure. Um, so the question is how to make women and girls safe spaces inclusive for, for men so and boys? You work with, 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 with boys and with men and, and since uh -huh. very much on women and girl friendly spaces, how can yeah. you inclusively for, for boys and, and men as well? Yeah, so I mean, the GBV sector um, certainly um, does respond to survivors, uh, male, men um, and boy survivors um, that, uh, you know, have experienced GBV. Our, our services, <clears throat> primarily because they are set up in women and girls safe spaces, um, the other types of services that we provide are, are really are targeted at women and girls. Um, and if you're interested to know more kind of why we haven't opened that up to men and boys, um, we have a whole um, kind of background and primer on that in our Women and Girls Safe Space Toolkit, which you can find on GBV Responders. Stephanie, I don't know if you could just put that up on the link. Um, but I, I, I think that all of us would agree that um, the importance of women and girls having a space where they can go, um, knowing that they are the majority of survivors, um, but also because of all, um, all the other limitations and restrictions on movement that they usually face, that, that having a space um, that they can go and receive support in um, that, that is just for them is, is quite critical. Um, so, I mean, there are, there are many other ways that we engage men and boys in our programming. Um, in fact, even in kind of the setup of a women and girls space, safe space or a GBV program, um, we do a lot of consultations with men and boys also wanting to understand, um, you know, how willing they are to support the setup of something like a women and girls safe space. Because in most of the con in humanitarian contexts, they're going to be, particularly men, are going to be the decision makers about whether or not a woman or girl could even go to that safe space. So we have to do a lot of work in the beginning um, to really kind of understand whether um, that's even something, you know, that they're willing to allow as a community. Um, we engage them in a lot of prevention work, too, which I know is not really the, the focus of of this session, um, so not, not necessarily prevention of MHPSS, but prevention of GBV work. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
I don't know if that answers Agnes's questions, but um, but oh, we yeah. absolutely I, do work. I think you see that also Stephanie has put two interesting reports as well in the, in the test. One is about a report of the help desk of the AOR, uh, and then another uh, is a project brief on the toolkit IRC is developing to facilitate group support sessions. If the answers were not in what you said, then definitely can uh, Agnes and other people can find it in the, the links provided here. Um, Sarah, we're moving towards the end of this panel discussion, correct? Yes, we are. If there was nothing else in the chat, then yes, we are. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much, wonderful panelists. <laughs> no, thank, thank you. Thank you, Cecil. Thank you, Murat. And thank you, Megan, as well. Um, just before we um, pass the ball to, to William, who we can now see on camera. Hello, William. Um, for the, the closing part of the... Um, of the session. Um, we're just going to show our second PowerPoint slide, actually, um, of the whole event. We did not want this to have an event with lots of PowerPoint on it. Um, so, uh, Bianca, yes, um, if you can put that full screen. Yes, so this is just some recaps of things that have come up um, in the past kind of hour and 45 minutes. Um, so the first thing is that, that mental health and psychosocial support is a joint responsibility. Okay. That's absolutely so. And that's something that we learned and we will never ever forget, right? <laughs> so uh, it has become very, very clear that it's, it's part of all sectors. Due to time constraints, we could not invite all the sectors here. For example, camp management is not here. But of course, yeah. also there, uh, MHPSS is a, is, a, is a very vital part, right? And it's not necessarily always called MHPSS. Sometimes it's just called uh, activities in the camp. Uh, but it's not so different from um, uh, activities level two of, of MHPSS, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So for MHPSS to be effective, as many of the speakers have highlighted, we need to be able to step out of our respective sectors. And this is really challenging if you're particularly working in a clusterized country or an IDP context, because the cluster system enforces pillars. It makes it really quite difficult to be a cross-cutting issue within the cluster system. Um, and it means that you have to go out and kind of join forces and you have to go out and hustle collectively um, for something. So um, that means coordinating together, advocacy together, doing service mapping together. So if there is a mapping of, of mental health and psychosocial support services, making sure that mapping is known, for example, by the GBV AOR, by Mine Action as well, so that those services can actually better reach victims um, in the case of mine action and, and GBV survivors. Um, and it also means referrals. Um, Elizabeth has mentioned this um, as well as others um, today. And also holding sectors accountable. So if you don't find mental health services are being discussed by health actors, then go. Go there and say, where do you want me to refer these people that are, are coming to us with mental health concerns or conditions? Also go to nutrition and say, look, people, people want to live, people are, are not able to eat and they're reporting psychological problems. As a nutrition sector, how can we help them? It's not just about the food, there's also the mental health and care practices. Exactly. Also we have um, uh, encouraging, this is also from the government perspective as well. Um, it's not just about us as humanitarian actors, we also work um, with governments. Um, so they also need to be encouraged to work together. Um, across government line ministries, because it crosses multiple line ministries at country level, um, as it does cross multiple sectors and clusters. And sorry, Kun, I interrupted your very important point. No, 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 no. I think what you were saying was, uh, was very important, actually. No, it's true. I mean, we need to be very assertive, actually. We need to stand for our points and we need to go. Uh, so we can do this through working together in the technical working group. Uh, if there is one existing, um, and not just going there, but really taking our points. If we are for child protection, then come up for for the interest of the children as well. The same for AOR, or for for the, for GBV AOR and so ever. Uh, and if there is no technical working group, then we have to go straight to the other sectors. Go to the health sectors. Ask for okay, where are your actors where we can refer to? And if they're non front well, then we have to say then can we then call for sectors for for, for actors to come in and step in because they really need it. A platform that I found very useful is also the intercluster working group in the country where you can also give uh, presentations uh, and you can go there as, there as well. Sarah, next point. Yes. Um, 
So we need service delivery at all levels of the pyramid. And I think this has been mentioned by a number of speakers as well. It's not just about you saying we only provide level two services or we operate here. Somebody has to provide services at all levels because a family and individual will present with multiple needs. And you need to be able to accompany and to refer that individual and family across the full spectrum of services that they require in order to meet their needs. And that often means having holistic um, approaches. Um, so we, we need to advocate for services where they don't exist. If there aren't safe spaces for mother and baby groups or for women and girls, then we need to advocate for their existence to in order to, to help them deal with any psychological issues and also to help with the group and the peer support activities. Similarly, if we're not seeing specialized health services, whether that be for older adults, for, for mine action victims, or, or for people with mental health conditions. And we also need to be advocating for that to be in place as well. So every layer is important in the pyramid um, and they all need to exist as well. And as mentioned in the quiz as well, something that we will never ever forget, we don't get <laughs> any more mental health from PSS. Uh, it's a spectrum, so we all have psychosocial needs or insights, uh, material needs to be communicated with the outside world and we also have our inner world which is the mental health world as well so no pss working group but mhpss working groups that's what we strive for um i'm gonna do the last one as well ask if you need support really uh, uh i know the gbv aor has a good help desk the the the, the cpa aor has an excellent help desk and then there is uh, of course sarah and fami who have been so helpful uh, if you need to support uh, when I was in the field, I, I used them so many times and, you know, really ask support. It's, it's, it's really a great resource that we have there. Sarah, you announce William. Yes, thank you very much, Kuhn. Um, it's with pleasure, actually, I get to announce our special guest, um, William. Um, who's some of you may not know him and, and some of you may know him very well. Um, William is the Global Protection Cluster Coordinator. I think you've been in place for a year now, I believe. William, or just over a year um, as well. Um, so thank you very much for, for taking the time to speak at the event. And I know you've got some exciting news also to share with us. Thank you so much, Sarah. Can you hear me well? Good. Sarah and Kuhn, we have had over 25 uh, sessions in the Global Protection Forum. This is the best facilitated session. Congratulations, that was so smooth, so cheerful. Uh, I have really, truly enjoyed it. Uh, so very well done. Uh, I really appreciated the style, the focus, uh, and the smoothness of, uh, of today's session. So well done. Uh, also for the participants on the chat box, I feel like we've been having two in-depth conversations, one orally with, uh, uh, with uh, with the camera and then on the chat box, it was as interesting and uh, as, as uh, uh, intense in a positive way. So congratulations also for all the participants for keeping the focus uh, on this. Um, I think the session reflects, Sarah, a bit what the reference group for MHPSS has been able to do. I want to congratulate also the reference group, one for the topic and the issue and all what you're producing, but also for being this model of uh, mature cross-sectoral humanitarianism and protection work. And I think the, the spirit of the, of the reference group uh, comes clearly to this session and, and, and I'm very glad with it. Um, now on the substance, um, I have retained um, three main points. Uh, before the announcement. First, it seems clear that there is political attention uh, on the issue of MHPSS. Uh, from policy perspective within the agencies at the leadership level in, in the humanitarian sector and beyond in development sector in the SDGs, etc. And that seems to be established. Yet, my experience in, in, in these, these attentions, they go in, in cycles and waves. Uh, and the fact that today in 2020, we have this attention, we shouldn't reduce the pressure. We should keep the pressure on uh, in terms of advocacy, 
within the agencies, across the agencies, and within the wider humanitarian sector. And that's, uh, that's an important point for us uh, to be self-congratulatory, but also use that as a, as a boost to keep the pressure on. So message one, keep on the pressure. Um, message two, I think uh, what came clear from Fahmi is that at the core, the basics of having enough resources in countries of conflicts and disasters to deal with MHPSS is a major problem. The figures he gave about South Sudan, uh, about uh, the general statistics of how many experts do we have in these countries are, are shocking. Uh, they're not shocking for the experts, for people with, like us on this group, but they are shocking in nature. And I think they need to go out more uh, and that seems to be a great uh, area for this nexus talk. Having preparedness and enough resources in countries to deal uh, with MHPSS um, seems to me uh, like a typical uh, space where development and peace actors can massively invest in that can really contribute to better humanitarian action should it be needed. And should it not be needed, uh, it's not a bad investment. The MHPSS per se uh, issue is, uh, is a good investment to, uh, to have in countries. So I think we need to, to benefit from this momentum. And I know a lot of good work has been done in this direction to really double up the pressure on development action uh, in countries that are fragile to really invest uh, in this area of work. The third, point I want to, to highlight is that what about the role of the protection sector? Uh, and it's very interesting. This topic is, a, uh, is an interesting one because, of course, it's a matter of competition. Some areas of protection say we're better in this than others, etc. So there is, a, there is this dimension that is important and, and I encourage this healthy, positive competition. There's also this cry, outcry for better collaboration within the protection sector and across other sectors. So here's the challenge of MHPSS. It has to be done by all. So how can we do that and prioritize it at the same time for each sector program and within protection for protection program? And the answer is this, I think MHPSS is a litmus test for mature, experienced, accountable, not to credit hungry humanitarianism. This is it. If there is one single indicator that can prove that the humanitarian and protection leadership in a country is strong, it's to have good MHPSS response because it's not politically outrageous issue that requires a lot of political tension and negotiation. It's respondable to within the realm of the humanitarian action. And should we have good humanitarian and protection leadership in country that is uh, uh, cross-sectoral and pushing others to do their job and doing our own job, uh, then I feel uh, there is strong opportunity uh, for MHPSS programming and response to be there. So we need to get this point out there. If you're a good humanitarian coordinator, if you are a good protection coordinator, then one single indicator can prove that. Get MHPSS right in your operation. So what are we doing by way of closure to get this right? I've been trying uh, since I started to, to, to learn from the AORs, from gender-based violence and the, the, the excellent feminist approach to, to this from the uh, Mine Action AOR, from uh, uh, our colleagues uh, that, uh, that also work on uh, child protection uh, intensely linked uh, uh, with, with MHPSS response and programs and started looking at other areas of protection, you know, disability inclusion, elderly inclusion, areas of protection that focus on youth uh, beyond, beyond the children age. Uh, we need to, to, to get the attention, one, to, to 
convince, to bring in this mindset that a stronger engagement of all protection action actors with MHPSS is very good for protection response itself. I repeat, a stronger engagement of all protection actors with MHPSS is, is good, is, is selfishly good for a very good protection response because it creates better protection response environment, but it also makes uh, uh, MHS PSS programs more effective, more equitably, more equitable and more, more accessible for all vulnerable groups that, that protection actors work with. So if we're selfish as protection actors, we need to get MHPSS right. And right means not doing it alone, but with others. If we're not selfish and we're good, really protection mature actors, then we should get MHPSS right as well. So uh, I, I uh, would like us all to keep this pressure on. And to do that, I would like to announce today that with Sarah, Fahmi, uh, Peter, uh, who's with us on the uh, on the call and Nancy who's with us on the call we're launching today a short uh, global protection cluster paper on MHPSS and protection outcomes so I would uh, call on anyone to put it yes I see someone has put it uh, on the link so I use this opportunity to launch this paper it would be a very basic paper for all of you to read it but that's the point the point is to send this very strong message out to all our cluster coordinators in the field who are also on this call, also all our members to say, MHPSS is your job. It's not your job alone, uh, get it right. Uh, so I can see that many of the final slide elements that you've put Sarah and Kuhn are in this paper. Uh, part of the major recommendations, no surprise, the same authors, <laughs> I believe, both for the, for the paper and the slideshow. Uh, I call on all of you to circulate this widely as one continuous step in us prioritizing this. Uh, and uh, I thank you for this uh, engaging discussion today and uh, close by saying, uh, let's keep the pressure on. Thank you. Thank you very much, William. Thank you, thank you, William. Uh, in this, yes. Well, I think uh, as far as I can see, the only thing that is still uh, there are two things left. Basically, uh, I want to invite everybody to uh, use the evaluation form and let us know how we can uh, improve uh, our sessions. That's very valuable for us. This information, and uh, we will also show um, the video animation of. Uh, the storybook, my uh, hero is you. Uh, we're going over time, so it's free if you want to look at it. Uh, you can put it on even while you're filling in uh, the uh, evaluation form. The link is in the chat, I hope. Uh, and also the link for the evaluation is in the chat. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, please provide your feedback in the webinar under the following link. Um, then I would like to thank everybody. Uh, first of all, all the participants for being interested in this topic. It is a very important topic in this moment of, of human history. Also, all the panelists. Uh, I think they gave some very valuable contributions, and I know that they're all very, very busy. And then the speakers, of course, uh, Fred of USAID. Uh, Michael for, for opening uh, this session and then William for closing this session. And then uh, behind the screens, uh, you can look behind your screen actually, you will find uh, Sonia and, and Bianca of the CPAOR who have been our DJs or Zoom masters and who did wonderfully well. And it has been very uh, pleasant to cooperate with you on this, Sarah. I wish you a very good uh, afternoon and remains of the day for everybody. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.
Bye. <laughs> 